Can I bring this word to you that God's placed in my spirit? Can I? I, I want you to look at your neighbor. and Well, don't look at your neighbor. Let me, let me just pause on that for a minute. Let me give you something. This is the thought that I want to resonate in your spirit. Sometimes we allow our preferences to keep us from his purpose. Grab that because that'll preach. That should have brought out some amen, some oh me, some hallelujahs. Or a Medea style, hallelujah. <laughs> Sometimes our personal preferences will keep us from his purpose. Look at your neighbor and announce to them the subject matter of our conversation today, and that is your help is on the way. Look at another neighbor and say, your help is on the way. Your help is on the way. I don't know if you've ever been in a place that you didn't feel like you could bring yourself out. You didn't know what to do. You didn't know how to get out of it. You didn't know where to go, what to do. You felt like you were lost, but then all of a sudden there was a divine moment in your life where God showed up, and in that divine moment you realized that you weren't lost, but you were found. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I came today to get my preach on. I don't know if anybody in here has ever been in a place that you couldn't bring yourself out, but God brought you out, and when you begin to reflect upon your life, you retrace your steps, you realize that God was with you all along. Somebody ought to praise him for the moment, the moment that he saved you, the moment that he delivered you, the moment that he healed you, the moment that he set you free. Some of you are waiting on a moment. Let me tell you something. You need to go ahead and give him preemptive praise because your moment is on the way. Good God Almighty. Some of you are saying, God, I'm in need. Listen, take heart and hold on because your help is on the way. Let me take you to a passage of Scripture that will be the narrative that we will explore today. I'm getting a little ahead of myself because I feel like preaching. But in 1 Kings chapter 19, balcony you look great today I don't know what it is when I say that everybody wants to turn around don't turn around the first Kings chapter 19 verses 15 through 21 let me read to you what the narrative says I'm just going to read a few verses just to establish our direction I'll just go ahead and read the whole narrative if you will it's just a few verses anyway and then we'll come back and elaborate. But here's what the word says beginning in verse 15. It says, the Lord said to him, go back the way that you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazel king over Aram. Hold on a second. He says, go back the way you came. You ought to circle that. Go back the way that you came. Someone look at your neighbor and say, go back. Look at your other neighbor and say, go back. There is a command, a directive from God concerning the direction of Elijah because God is concerned with the direction that Elijah is going in. This verse or this passage will also offer us some direction in our conversation today. Look what it says in verse 16 and following. It says, also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, and from Abel, and to succeed you as a prophet. Jehu will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of, of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death anyone who escapes the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. Verse 19, it says, so Elijah went from there and found Elisha, son of Snapchat. First time I read that, I thought it said Snapchat. I'm thinking, whew, it's been around a long time, hasn't it? Some of y'all didn't realize it was around now. That joke didn't go over good in the first service. They're just a few years older, maybe. But it says that he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, and he threw his cloak around him. Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. He said, let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye. And he said, then I will come with you. 
Go back. Everybody say, go back. Elijah replied, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him, and he went back, and he took his yoke of oxen, and he slaughtered them, and he burned the plowing equipment. He burned the plowing equipment. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat, and he gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah, and he became his servant. Hold on a second. There are three verses that will drive the narrative for us today. First is verse 15, where God tells Elijah to go back. The next is verse 20, where Elijah tells Elisha to go back. And the last is the end of verse 21, where Elisha, it says, set out to follow Elijah, to serve him, to become his servant. Those three verses, we will absolutely spend a lot of time around that concept. But the first thing that I want to do is paint the image for you of what's really transpiring. Here you have, just, just be seated. Here you have this great prophet, Elijah who's done these great miracles, who walks up to Elisha, that moment in Elisha's life, he taps Elisha on the shoulder. He says, come and follow me. Elisha goes home. He burns the plowing equipment. He kills the oxen. He serves it up to his friends. They have a party, and the Bible says, then he set out to follow Elijah to serve him. It was a moment. Elijah walks up to him in the field. He's plowing behind 12 yoke of oxen. Elijah taps him on the shoulder. At that moment, the life of Elisha changed. Not only did the life of Elisha change, but the life of Elijah changed. Not only did the life of Elijah change, but the life of Israel changed. The historical point of change began to take place at that moment in time. Their direction changed. What would happen in the rest of their lives changed. What would happen in the nation of Israel changed. There was a moment a divine moment. It was just a moment that caused what happened after to be markedly different than what happened before. There was a pre-moment and a post-moment. It was a moment, a divine moment, Richie. That moment, that moment in your life where you say, I do, that moment when that child is born, that moment when you graduate from that school, that moment that you win that championship, and everything that happens after that moment is markedly different than what happened before. It's a moment. In fact, what I could do with you right now is share with you some events or some dates, and, and your memory would go back to a moment dates or events that we would all have in common, like September 1st, or September 11th, I should say, 2001. September 11, 2001 was a moment. In fact, for many of you right now, your minds are going back to the moment that you found out and heard that the World Trade Centers were under attack, that moment. Or maybe there's another moment, maybe it's September no, no, not September. What was this day? January, January 28th, 1986. That's the moment that 73 seconds after liftoff, the space shuttle Challenger exploded. Maybe you remember exactly where you were at that moment. I do because I skipped school that day. Sorry, Mama. That moment. In fact, I can tell you the exact moment that this series was birthed in my spirit was on January 9th of this year. January 9th of this year, I was watching the college national football championship where the Clemson Tigers defeated the Alabama Crimson Tide. No, go, go Tigers. And as I'm watching this game unfold, there was a commercial that was advertising Clemson University, and the commercial's title was Clemson Moments. And they were showing all of these moments in the life and the history of Clemson University and how so many lives have been changed because of Clemson University. At that moment, I realized I had a series that was being birthed in my spirit, and I came into the office the next day, and I said, we've got to do a series called Moments. How many of you know God can speak to you through a commercial? So the staff said, what is the context? Everyone say context. 
what is the context of that concept? And so I said, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of those divine moments in Scripture where God met with someone and their life was forever changed because they answered the call or their life changed because they responded to that divine moment and the direction in their life was forever changed because this divine moment where God showed up when they couldn't do anything for themselves. In hopes that we'll reflect upon that divine moment where God has done something in our lives, and because of it, we've responded in such a way that our lives have taken a different direction. I don't know who this is for, but someone needs to hear this. This is a prophetic word because some of you right now, the memory that is coming to your mind, the moment that is coming to your mind is not a memory that you really want to celebrate, but rather it's a horrific memory. Can I tell you something? You need to understand this. Whoever that is, you need to understand this. Whether you're at home watching, whatever the case may be, you need to realize that what the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good because the Bible says in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. But if you read scripture and you study it, you see that there are these stories where these divine moments, this moment where God shows up, and when God shows up in that person or person's lives, there is a difference. They respond to it in such a way that it changes the course, the direction. It changes their motivation. It changes their lives. So Elijah walks up to Elisha. He taps Elisha on the shoulder, and he says, come on and follow me. Elisha goes home, he burns the plowing equipment, he slaughters the oxen, he calls all of his friends over, they have this huge party, and then the Bible says that he set out to follow Elijah. I don't know that we can fully comprehend the context of that narrative because we're not necessarily an agrarian culture. But you have to understand the context of what is happening in this narrative or you will misinterpret the narrative. Context is important because if you don't understand the context of something, you will misinterpret that something. I don't know if you've ever received a text message, but you didn't understand the text message because you didn't understand the context of the text message. Maybe you misinterpreted the text message because you didn't know the context in which it was sent. Like recently, I I had a conversation with a pastor who who we both said the same statement. The statement was, we have parking lot trouble, parking lot problems. He said, I have parking lot problems at my church. I said, so do we. We have parking lot problems. Same statement. I followed it up by saying, yeah, we have have more cars than we have spaces. And he said, no, 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 that's not our problem. We can't find enough cars to put in our spaces. (laughs) Same statement, different context. You see, I don't know that we fully understand the context of this narrative because we're not an agrarian or agricultural culture society. Burning the plows is significant. Burning the plows and killing the oxen is like you going home today. It's equal to you going home today, burning your house down, all of your belongings, burning your job down, and having no insurance. It doesn't make sense. It's an incredible sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. it's It's a commitment that we don't understand because we're not an agricultural Or an agrarian society, but rather we're a social media culture. And sacrifice for us is taking a Bible verse and putting it on your Facebook wall. (laughs) Sacrifice for us is coming to church on Sundays. Hello. Isn't it quiet in God's house? Sacrifice for us is... And then we wonder, I didn't think that would get an amen, so let me move on. (laughs) But then we wonder why it's so tough for us to identify those divine moments in our lives. We wonder why we don't see those moments like we thought that we would see. Because our level of commitment and sacrifice may not be what it should be. But then I begin to think about this. And I begin to think, well, that's how it started out for Elisha, if you think about it. Because Elisha looked at Elijah. Elijah tapped him on the shoulder. He said, come on with me. And Elisha said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. i got to go back and talk to my family. And I've got to say goodbye and all of that good stuff. And Elijah looked at him and said, go back. What have I done to you? What have I done to you? Go back. So, 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 So what is it that I've done to you? And if you understand the context of that, 
It's as if Elijah is saying to Elisha, listen, Elisha, this is not between me and you anyway. This is between you and God. Go back. This moment is between you and God, Elisha. It's, it's not between me and you. It's between you and God. And, but then I began to study this narrative, and I realized that there could be some things that we're taking out of context in this narrative. I begin to look at the narrative and understand that could it be that we are misinterpreting this phrase, go back, this rhetorical question that, that it looks like Elijah asked, go back, go back, what have I done to you? And I thought, could we be watering down the meaning through the grammatical composition of this event? Could it be that that was not really a rhetorical question, go back? but it might have been a statement that should end in an exclamation point. Go back. Not go back, go back, but rather go back. Because the more that I studied that, I found some different translations. And one of the translations that I found was the message translation. And, and here's what Elijah said to, to Elisha in that translation. It says, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. But then he says, but remember what God just did. Oh, hold on a second. That changes the context of that narrative for me. He says, go ahead, but remember what God just did. You see, sometimes I think we forget what God has done. Sometimes I think we forget what God has already done, which causes us to miss the next divine moment in our lives. But if we really look back and remember all that God has done, we'll see when we retrace our steps that he's been with us every single step of the way. Go ahead, but don't you forget what God has done. And so Elisha goes home, and he burns the plowing equipment, the 12 yoke of oxen. He slaughters them. He cooks them. He serves them up for food. There's this huge party. Then the Bible says that he set out to follow Elijah to serve him. Hold on a second. 12 yoke of oxen. Historians and theologians tell us something about that. They tell us that that means that he was not just an average farmer who was barely getting by, but he was actually an affluent man with 12 yoke of oxen. And yet, what did, what did he do? He burned it all. He gave it all away. He burned it and gave it all away. He gave it all away so that he could walk into the supply of God. Hold on a second. Here's what the Holy Spirit dropped in my lap. You cannot, you cannot experience the supply of God if you are unwilling to engage in sacrifice. Did you grab that? Let that resonate in your spirit. You cannot experience the supply of God if you are unwilling to engage in sacrifice. It's the context. When I was thinking about the context of this narrative, I thought there are so many scripture verses in the Bible that we kind of take out of context. I mean, they're still worthy of celebration, but I've noticed that I can preach in many different places, and I've had the, the honor and the privilege to do so, but I've also noticed that there are certain verses that I can throw into my sermon, and when those verses go into the sermon and they come out of my mouth, out of my mouth in, in such a way, people get so excited, they jump up on their feet. It has nothing to do with me, but it has everything to do with the word that God has pronounced over them, and they'll get excited and begin to applaud. Like, God didn't create you to be a failure. He created you to be a conqueror. In fact, the Bible says that you're more than a conqueror, and people will begin to applaud. Why? Because they've been on the losing side, and God brought them into the winning side there's other verses like the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and if the spirit of God that dwelled that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you that means his power dwells in you and if his power dwells in you that means his promise is before you and if his promise is before you he will enable you to do, do and go where he's called you to go after all God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you think ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within you somebody ought to praise him 
Then there's another verse where it says that David stood before Goliath and he said, Goliath, this day you will fall. You come against me with the sword and the spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord and today I will prevail. You can overcome your giants, the giant of your past, the giant of your problem, the giant of your difficulties, the giant of your depression. You can defeat that giant. Then there's another verse that says, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. My supply is not my bank account. My supply is not my career. My supply is not my riches. My supply is not my skill set, but he's my supply. The supply of my hope, the supply of my help, the supply. Come on, somebody. Help me praise him. He's my supply. But when you understand the context of those verses, you might celebrate them a little differently. In fact, the verse that my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory was written by Paul when he was in prison, awaiting execution. And Paul was able to write, my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory because he had experienced the supply of God. And because he had experienced the supply of God, he was willing to experience the pain of prison. He was willing to experience the pain of prison because he had experienced the supply of God. Are you grabbing this? And because he was willing to experience the pain of prison, he, even though it did not look like he would prefer. Why? Because he wanted to accomplish God's purpose. Hold on a second because that's deep. He was willing to experience the pain of prison because he had already experienced the supply of heaven. And he went through prison even though it didn't look like what he would prefer. If you think about David, David fought Goliath. We all want to defeat Goliath. But after David fought Goliath, he lived in a cave for years and lost everything. But yet he's still able to write the 23rd Psalm. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear because God is with me. His rod and his staff they comfort me. He causes me to lie down beside quiet waters. He restoreth my soul. He prepareth a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What I'm trying to say is we want the victory over Goliath, but we do not want the cave. We want to be able to be tapped on the shoulder with that divine moment, but we do not want to burn the plows. But what I've discovered in my walk is that many times the greatest moments in our lives are a reward for our greatest sacrifice. Wow, chew on that one. In fact, recently someone just in the last week or so walked up to me and said, man, hop in the park. They didn't go to this church. But they said hop in the park was incredible. 30,000 people showed up. That's incredible. Listen, that is incredible. But in order for us to love on our community that way, It required us to burn the plows, to sacrifice both before and during and even after. The sacrifice that was required and still is required is overwhelming. In fact, a reporter asked me that night at Hop in the Park, and it went on the news channels. He said, why does your church do this? Why does Epicenter do this? And I said, because we want to love on our community. But can I tell you something? Love will cost you something. You'll have to burn the plows. I thank the Lord for people who are in this church who've burned the plows, so to speak. For those who come to church on Sunday morning and they get here at 6.30 so they can begin to set up so that when you get here, it's all ready. The worship team who begins to rehearse, the connections team who sets everything up, the flags, the tents, to make sure that you've got worship guides and all of that stuff, to make sure the backs of the chairs have envelopes and pencils and pens, whatever it is that you need, to make sure that people are here to give you a smile when you come in and say, hey, we're glad you're here, so that you can have a moment in here with God. Our early childhood ministry team, people who watch the nursery so that you can come in and bring your kids and take them to the nursery so that you can come into church and praise God and have a divine moment. Our, our e-kids so that you can leave your kids down there and they can receive spiritual instruction so that they can grow in their relationship with Christ so that they'll have a moment. All of the people who run our production team, the person who's running the camera so that the people on the other side, wherever they are today, whether they're at home, whether they're in their cars, whether they're in, in their businesses or whatever they may be, they may have a divine moment with God right where they are where their lives will be forever changed. It requires burning the plow. 
Somebody give the Lord a hand clap for our serve team. But I began to think about Elisha. And if you know anything about his life, years later, he's still hanging out with Elijah. And he says to Elijah, he says, Elijah, I want a double portion of what you have. That's what Elisha wanted. But in order for Elisha to experience that, he had to first burn the plows. What I'm trying to say is you've got to start where you are in order to get to where you want to be. And you may not be exactly where you want to be, but what can you do in the meantime? Can I tell you what you can do? You can sacrifice and you can burn the plows. Everybody say burn the plows. What is the plow? I need you to hear this. Let me tell you what the plow is. The plow is the thing that has you looking at the hind end of an ox. I could have said something else, but I didn't. The plow is the thing that has you looking at the hind end of the ox. The plow is the thing that is keeping your field of vision blocked. The plow is the thing that is keeping you where you are right now when God has called you to go somewhere else. The plow, the plow is the thing. You see, some of you need to get out of the season that you're in, but you're not willing to go to the next season. You're hanging on to the plow, and the reason why you're not willing to go to the next season is because even though you're uncomfortable with where you are, it seems to be more uncomfortable to go to what you don't know. Some of you are allowing the predictability of your difficulties to out way the unpredictability of your future. Good Lord have mercy. Somebody needs to help me preach in this place. So rather you come into this place, you come into this place and you lift up your hands and you sing songs about breakthrough and you're praising God, but when you go home, you don't burn the plow. You go home and you don't burn the plow. I'm just going to plow right here behind this ox. I can't see a thing in front of these big old ox. All I'm seeing is the hind end of this ox. I'm going to stay right here and plow. I'm going to plow with all this fear. I'm going to plow with the plow of fear. I'm not going to burn the plow and tell the plow that it has to be burned. Why? Because God didn't create me with a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I'm going to hang out with this plow of insecurity rather than burn the plow and tell the plow that God created you in his image. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. Oh, I'm going to hang out in this plow of brokenness. I'm, I'm going to hang out in this brokenness even though I need restoration rather than burning the plow and stepping into the restoration of God because my God of all grace, the God of all grace after you have suffered for a little while will himself restore you. But I'm going to hang out with this plow. I want financial freedom, but I'm going to hang out behind financial oppression because I, I, I'm not willing to burn the plow and change my spending habits because that sounds too much like a sacrifice. I'm going to hang out plowing right behind this plow even though I need restoration in my marriage, but I'm not going to burn the plow because I like to remind my spouse of the old season. Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. What I am trying to say to you is some of you will stay behind the plow. Your field of vision will be blocked. You're not going to where God wants you to go, and the reason why is because you have settled to stay right there, right behind the back end, the hind end of the ox. Mm. You see, sometimes your personal preferences will keep you out of God's purpose. Mm. Oh, Lord, have mercy. You see, let me tell you something about this moment. This moment for Elisha was a moment where God was burning some things away from his life. Some things that he had been holding on to, 12 yoke of oxen, which meant he was an affluent man. But yet he had finally discovered that even after all of his affluence, that it was not good enough to bring him out. Only God could bring him out. <laughs> Somebody needs to, to hear this. You see, this moment today that God has created for you, this divine moment, is all about burning some things away in your life so that you can walk into what God has for you. Somebody needs to hear this. This is a prophetic word. I need you to grab hold of this. I need everyone in here to tune your ears and your spirit into this message right here and right now. And that is this. Some of you need to stop. Here's what God wants you to know. You need to stop comparing yourself to others, comparing what you have to what others have, comparing what you don't have to what others have, because God says, stop that. I didn't create you to be like them. I have a specific call and purpose for your life. Mm. 
Hold on, let me go one step further. Let me just say this to you. Some of you, God wants you to know that the reason why you are frustrated in your life is because you are plowing in a place. God is saying to you right now, the reason why you are frustrated in the place that you are plowing is because he never called you to plow in that place in the first place. Good Lord, have mercy. So what do you have to do? You've got to burn the plows and set out to follow him. Is this okay? You see, I've done a lot of work to get to this place right here. This is, this is the crossroads in this message. Because up until this point, it just seems like this whole thing is really about Elisha. But if you truly understand the context of the narrative, you realize that this is as much about Elijah as it is Elisha. You see, prior to this event, prior to Elijah walking up to Elisha, tapping him on the shoulder, prior to that, Elijah, this great prophet, had had this incredible victory in his life. This incredible victory in his life. It was the greatest miracle, if you will, where 900 false prophets, he took them on. He called down fire from heaven. He annihilated them. He had them, he had them killed. He had them executed. And then there had been a famine in the land. There had been a drought in the land. And all of a sudden, Elijah says, he prophesies, there's going to be rain. There hadn't been rain in years. And he says, there's a cloud the size of a man's hand. And rain begins to fall. At that moment, the wicked king and his wife Jezebel said to Elijah, sent word to him, we've put a bounty on your head. You will die. We're going to kill you. Elijah went into a deep depression. He went into a deep depression, and he began to tell God, God, I want to die. Take my life. I'm, I'm not worthy. It seems like I've been doing all of this work, and it's, not to, it's to no avail. No one's following you. I'm the only one that's zealous for you. Everyone else has bowed a knee to Baal, and, and I don't understand this. I feel like I'm all alone. Please take my life. I have no help. No one's with me. No one notices what I've been doing. I just want to die. And if you'll remember the story, God led him up on a mountain. When he was so deeply depressed, God led him up on the mountain. And when he got up on the mountain, there was an earthquake. But the Bible says God wasn't in the earthquake. There was, there was this mighty wind, but the Bible says that God wasn't in the wind. There was this, this fire, but the Bible says God wasn't in the fire. There was earth, there was wind, there was fire. Earth, wind, and fire It's the first mentioning of the group. <laughs> Do you remember... The 21st of September. <laughs> yeah, come on. Crazy. Y'all crazy. I ain't never even heard that song. I had to YouTube it. And way before my time, but they pretty good, though. Holy Spirit, come back. Where were we? Okay, okay, okay. So earth, wind, and fire showed up, and Elijah was rocking out on the mountain. But God wasn't in the earthquake. God wasn't in the wind. God wasn't in the fire. But there was this still, small voice. And the still, small voice spoke to him in verse 15. If you'll remember, we started in verse 15. I just kind of read through it. But now I'm going to give you the context. In verse 15, look at it again. The still, small voice said this. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. He was running from it. Go back the way you came. And go to the desert of Damascus, and when you get there, anoint Hazel, king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elijah to succeed you. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the sword of Hazel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. Hold on a second. I, I, I don't think you're catching what I'm throwing here because this is significant. If you'll remember his, his, his depression, he said, there's nobody here. No, no, no. There's, there's nothing that's been happening, and, 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 and I'm going to die. I want to die. God, take my life because I'm all alone. My, my ministry has not been successful whatsoever. And, and, and you'll remember that, that Jezebel said, you're going to die. She put a bounty on his head that you're, you're going to die. And, and, but right here in verse 15, what is the first thing that God does for Elijah? He says, I want you to go and anoint the new king. What is God telling him? God is telling him that their reign is about to end and the new reign is about to begin and you're going to outlast what they're trying to do to you. But he didn't grab it. Instead, he began to complain about there's no one following you, God. 
I've been doing all this work, and I feel like I'm all alone, and nobody's ever noticed it. It's to no avail. But then God says, no, it's not. There are 7,000 people who have been saved due to your ministry. There are 7,000 people who have called upon my name. There are 7,000 people who have not bowed their knee. Your ministry has been much more successful than you realize. There are things that are happening that you didn't even know. I don't know who this is for, but some of you are just trudging along, and you feel like no one has noticed you. You feel like that everything that you have done is in vain and that no one notices what you're doing. But let me tell you something. Your faithfulness and obedience is moving more people than you ever would realize. And if you continue to do what God has called you to do, he will raise you up. And in that divine moment, he will show you how successful your labor has been. Good God Almighty, somebody ought to praise him. Hold on a second. It gets better. He said, I'm all alone. Ain't nobody even with me. Nobody even cares about me. So he said, anoint the new king because Ahab and Jezebel's reign is over. You've got 7,000 people who are with you. But I'm going to send you a special help. Elisha. He went and tapped on his shoulder and he said, come on. And Elisha went back and he burned all the plows. Listen, you're missing what I- I'm throwing because what I'm saying is that we thought the moment was about Elisha, but really the moment is about Elijah. And it's the answered prayer that God is giving to Elijah. It is the promise that God is giving to Elijah. When he thought he was unsuccessful, God showed him how successful he was. When he thought he was overrun by a wicked king, he realized that God is going to take them out. When he thought he was by himself, then came Elisha. Why? Because Because your help is on the way. Your help is on the way. I said your help is on the way. Because your your destiny is not controlled by your humanity, but rather by the divinity of God. And when God showed him he was with him, it began to answer the promise that he was holding on to. You see, when he saw the problems of the mountain, God unveiled the promise that I will never leave you nor forsake you. Why? Because your help is on the way. Your help is on the way. Your help, somebody high five the person beside of you. Get up on your feet. Give God praise. Why? Because your help is on the way. But you may have to burn the plows and set out to follow him. Lift your hands all over this building. Father, there are people in this place who are overwhelmed by what is staring them in the face, and they need your help. God, may you open up heaven on their behalf. May they feel the warmth of your touch. Some of you need to understand something. God is saying to you, you go back the way you came because I'm not done and what you're trying to leave. And if you'll go back and grab hold of what I'm about to do in your life, mm, you will have a life that you never dreamed of. I'll do things that exceed, far exceed your imagination. That's the kind of God I am. Your help is on the way.